Our next and last story is by John Slatt of WCS's Asia program. John is an ornithologist by training, but found himself in the middle of a mega mammal death match. John. Hey, thanks. So this is a story that starts with a tiger. It involves a bear or two. But if I had to choose, I'd say this is a story about a crow. Oh, I'm a wildlife biologist, and I work in the Russian Far East. It's a region so far east that borders North Korea, and the town I'm based in is only about 200 miles from Japan. It's a region with steep coastal cliffs and rolling mountains controlled by tigers, leopards, bears, and lynx. The rivers are choked with salmon, and there are very few people. Now, I'm, I'm a bird guy at heart, and most of my 20 years in the region has been focused on birds. First, songbirds, and then more recently, black and fish elk. And these are enormous salmon-eating birds that live in some of the most remote corners of Northeast Asia. And that's what I was doing in the village of Ternay when the story takes place in June 2006. I was just finishing my field season searching for black and fish elk. Ternay is also home to WCS's Siberian Tiger Project. And I didn't work for WCS then, but I've been friendly with those guys for a number of years. And over evening beers, I'd hear stories about tigers, ro tigers roaring in the bushes or black charges by bears. And I want to be clear that these stories weren't told with bravado, but rather with matter-of-factness. You know, <laughs> this is what I did at my job today, sort of way. <laughs> so I, I'd listen to these guys and secretly be happy that these things weren't happening to me. <laughs> and I think a lot of the non-large carnivore researchers in the room can sympathize that there's something kind of intimidating about massive, toothy predators that like to hide from things and then later jump out and kill those things. <laughs> <laughs> so when John Goodrich, who was then the field coordinator for the Siberian Tiger Project, asked me to help him find a dead tiger, that seemed like a relatively benign activity and one that would not involve a lot of running away. <laughs> See, John had received reports that a radio-colored male tiger hadn't moved in days. And this likely meant one of two things, and both of them were bad. Either the tiger was just laying in the forest dead, or it had been shot and its collar removed by poachers to cover their tracks. So John picked me up in his truck, and we drove about 10 miles west of Ternay, so we were fairly close to town. And when we stopped, he took out his VHF receiver. And this is what we were going to use to hone in on this dead animal. He turned it on, and we were both surprised to hear the steady beats of an active radio signal. So radio signals are either active, meaning the tiger is up and moving about, or they're passive, meaning that the tiger, or more precisely, the collar, hasn't moved in a number of hours. And it was a series of these passive signals over, over several days that had prompted field assistants to deem this tiger dead. Clearly, clearly they've been mistaken, and I assume that our afternoon search was over. And that a live tiger is a very different beast than a dead one. But John wanted to push it on just to be sure. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was possible that the tiger was dead, and that a, a fox or some other carnivore had been tugging at the carcass and jostled the collar into activity. So we follow the strength of the signal across a valley and start up a hill, with John stopping periodically, periodically to reassess our trajectory. About halfway up this hill, the signal weakens and then vanishes. We move ahead slowly, and right before we got to the ridge, we find a tiger bed. Now, a tiger bed is just an impression on the forest floor in the leaves where the tiger had just been. It's, it heard us approaching, stood up, moved over the, the hill crest, and into the neighboring valley in retreat. So my eyes are fixed on this ridge, <laughs> just waiting for a tiger to come exploding across it, because I've heard stories that start like this. <laughs> but John's engrossed in this tiger bed. He's uh, picking up stray hairs and holding them to the light. He kneels down closely and inhales. And he, he, when he stands up, he has this puzzled look on his face. And he says, yeah, I, I smell tiger, but I also smell bear. <laughs> I think this tiger's been eating a bear. <laughs> Let's go look for a dead bear. <laughs> so understand that this part of Northeast Asia is the only place in the world where tigers and brown bears share the same forests. 
you essentially have two kings in one castle. Uh, they do interact and they do sometimes kill each other. In fact, there was once a radio collared male tiger whose prey preference, and I want to repeat that, whose prey preference was female brown bears. <laughs> so the prospect that John and I have stumbled upon a direct and fatal encounter between these two mega carnivores filled me with simultaneous feelings of dread and wonder. We began the systematic search for a kill, moving in a circle emanating from that tiger bed. And every once in a while, we'd walk into a patch of forest that was just heavy with the aroma of death. Sense of decay can sometimes drift from a point of origin and hang in the air far from the carcass itself. And so, especially in a forest with a dense understory, it can be surprisingly difficult to find a giant dead thing, even though you know it's there. <laughs> So we searched for the better part of an hour before giving up. We saw a log and, and sat on it, or figuring out how we are going to get back to the truck from there. When I heard the sound of wings, I look, I look up and I see a crow flying towards us. When it gets to us, this crow looks down, caws, wheels in the sky, and then flies back in the direction from which it had come. We watch it, continue talking, and then a minute later, that same bird, or one just like it, comes back and does the same thing. John's interest in the search is renewed. He, re he recalls stories of hunters being led to deer or other prey items by, by ravens who were then hoping to feed off the scraps once the hunter's done. And he wondered aloud if something similar was happening here. We need to follow that crow, he says. <laughs> and we do. About a hundred yards later, the forest just opens up to a small clearing about 20 feet across. And the first thing I see right at my feet is the severely decomposed hind leg of a bear. It's mostly pale bone, little bits of rancid flesh hanging off. It was just a, a horror of a thing that shared a striking and eerie resemblance to a skeletal human leg. A bit further on, we find a forearm, a bit further a skull. And based on the tooth wear, this had been a very old brown bear. I noticed our surroundings with a little more clarity. And Everything was devastated. It looked like a grenade had gone off. Uh, the shrubs were stripped of their leaves, branches were broken, and the soil had been scraped from the forest floor and piled into a mound in the center of the space. I had no idea what I was looking at, but John knew immediately. This is a bear cache, he says. See, brown bears sometimes hide their kills for future consumption, and they do so by burying the meat under a pile of dirt and debris that they scrape together. And in this case, what had been in that cache was another bear. But we started to piece together the evidence based on what we knew. This old brown bear had died, whether it had been killed by a tiger, another bear, I have some other reason we don't know. But at some point, it had been buried by another brown bear. And at some point, a tiger had wandered along, discovered this cache, and spent several days digging up and consuming various bear bits. And this was why the taller uh, tiger's radio collar had been giving off these passive signals. It had been lazing about in a bear-induced food coma. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I heard some crows bustling impatiently in the canopy, and I was re reminded how we found this place to begin with. And were the crows waiting for us to dig up more bear? <laughs> and this is why I think this is a story about a crow. So despite all we know about tigers and bears and the technology of VHF collars and radio uh, equipment. It was a bird, it was a crow that helped us figure out what was going on here. And, and I think there's an important lesson in this to not rely too much on technology. These innovations, they may be smart and they may be convenient, but they're not always right and they don't have all the answers. So remember to heed the signs that you see in nature and to always follow the crow.